from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hello and welcome to the Library of Congress. My name is Rob Casper. I'm the head of the library's Poetry and Literature Center here. And I could not be more excited to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the acclaimed uh, Essential uh, International Writers Program at the University of Iowa. It's a historic occasion for literature and for our country. I would like to take this opportunity to thank not only IWP for being here, but also thank our presenting partners the Hispanic Division at the Library of Congress, and the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs at the U.S. Department of State. Uh, before we begin, let me ask you, uh, since you're all taking pictures of your cell phones, why don't you just put them on um, silent? I'm gonna turn mine off just to make sure they don't interfere with the recording of the event. Um, this event is being recorded and uh, we'll have a Q&A section at the end. By participating in that section, you give us permission for future use of the recording. Uh, second, let me tell you a little bit about the Poetry and Literature Center. We are home to the U.S. Poet Laureate. Uh, our current Poet Laureate is Tracy K. Smith. Uh, and we put on 20 to 30 programs like this one throughout the year. Uh, in fact, next week on November 9th, uh, in honor of Veterans Day, we are featuring Pulitzer Prize winning poet Yusuf Kominyaka reading his favorite poems of World War I in honor of our exhibit upstairs, Echoes of the Great War, American Experiences of World War I. To learn more about the programs that we do uh, and programs sponsored by not only the Poetry and Literature Center, but also the Hispanic Division, you can uh, sign our sign-up sheet out in the foyer uh, you can also visit our website, www.loc.gov. Uh, speaking of the Hispanic Division, uh, I, I know most of you got uh, to check out the uh, collections of uh, Gilbert Garcia Marquez, 100 Years of Solitude books that we have there, curated by our reference librarian, Catalina Gomez. If you haven't had a chance to go check them out, you should. Um, they're wonderful and exciting, and show the history of that book, which we'll talk about in today's program. You can read about uh, the participants in today's program. Uh, in your print program, you should all have one at your seat. Um, but I need to introduce Chris Merrill, the longtime director of the IWP. Chris Merrill has published six, selections of six collections of poetry, including Watchfire, for which he received the Laval Younger Poets Award from the Academy of American Poets many works of translation and edited volumes, among them The Forgotten Language, Contemporary Poets of Nature, and six books of nonfiction. His work has rightly been translated into nearly 40 languages, and his honors include a knighthood in arts and letters from the French government. His journalism also appears in many publications. As director of the IWP, Merrill has undertaken cultural diplomacy missions to more than 50 countries, and I can say personally that Chris is a tireless, inspiring advocate for writers in writing. Please join me in welcoming and congratulating Christopher Mao. Thank you, Rob. It's a thrill to be here today. The IWP has had the good luck to partner with the Library of Congress for the last several years, and this year is an especially rich moment for us. Uh, so I'm going to read just a tiny little uh, introduction to what we'll be doing today. Many years later, when he faced the firing squad, Colonel Arellano Buendia was to remember that distant afternoon when his father took him to discover ice. So begins 100 Years of Solitude, Gabriel Garcia Marquez's masterpiece, which was published 50 years ago in Buenos Aires and is widely regarded as the key text in the Latin American boom, the literary renaissance of the 1960s and 70s that reshaped world literature. The Colombian novelist, journalist, and Nobel laureate Garcia Marquez and fellow writers like 
Jorge Luis Borges, Julio Cortazar, Jose Donoso, Carlos Fuentes, and Mario Vargas Llosa were not only bold explorers of form, history, and politics, but also influential thinkers whose works continue to inspire intrepid spirits to strike out on their own. Take that opening sentence, which brings together a wealth of disparate elements, a firing squad, a visit to an ice house, a father and son, past and present, in the service of what critics from term magical realism, a vision of the human condition that resonated around the world. In that same year, 1967, the American poet Paul Engel and his soon-to-be second wife, the Chinese novelist Nia Hua Ling, hosted the first residency of the University of Iowa's International Writing Program. Engel had directed the Iowa Writers Workshop for decades, and upon his retirement, Hua Ling convinced him to start a similar program from writers, for writers from abroad what he called the craziest idea he had ever heard. Then he and Waling proceeded to build the IWP, believing that distinguished foreign poets and writers would welcome the chance to spend three months in Iowa City, working and exchanging ideas with their counterparts from other lands. In this, the Angles anticipated Kevin Costner's famous line from Field of Dreams, a film set in Iowa and based on a novel by a graduate of the Writers' Workshop who wrote, If you build it, they will come. <laughs> With funding from the U.S. Department of State, the university arranged of philanthropic sources, and through bilateral agreements, the IWP has hosted over the last half century more than 1,400 writers from 150 countries, including 189 from Central and South America. The IWP, uh, it, uh, it included in this are two, two prize winning, uh, two Nobel laureates, Orhan Pamuk from Turkey, Mo Yan from China, best selling writers from every continent, and major boom figures like Jose Donoso, the Chilean author of The Obscene Bird of Night, as well as post boom writers like Luisa Valenzuela, the Argentinian author of The Lizard's Tale and Gustavo Sainz, the Mexican author of The Princess of the Palace. In short, the IWP brings together writers from distant lands in the service of literature, that magical arena in which all manner of memories, impressions, and stories continue, combined to address the complicated days and nights of characters real and imagined, and cultural diplomacy which has been defined as the exchange of ideas and information. The result, on the one hand, poems and novels, plays and films, essays and nonfiction works, all seeking to bear witness to our walk in the sun. And on the other hand, the gift of cultural exchange, which is the capacity to entertain a larger, more nuanced understanding of the infinitely diverse peoples with whom we share this earth. That's the theme of what we'll be talking about today, and we'll begin with Cynthia Schneider, the professor, professor from Georgetown who, has, who probably knows more about cultural diplomacy than anybody on the planet. Cynthia? Well, that's a, a, a dubious idea, but thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And it's, it's really wonderful to be here. I don't want to take up too much of your time away from these wonderful writers we're going to hear from. But I think I'm going to begin by quoting a Dutch historian who said, Johan Housinga, who said, if you want to understand America, read Walt Whitman. And after that, watch American cinema. Now, this idea that you understand a country through its writers, through its creative writers, who of course are also involved in cinema, is such an important idea, I think, and uh, I wish very much that it was an idea that policymakers in America not only believed in, but practiced. I have been trying for the last 10 years to uh, integrate politics and culture to try to persuade policymakers 
here that culture is not just a nice thing that you praise once a year at the Kennedy Center Honors, but actually something that is essential to international relations. If you look around, you can see how successful I've been. But um, <laughs> this idea came to me when I had the great privilege of serving as US ambassador to the Netherlands under President Clinton. And there I came to that position um, as an art historian. And in that position, I could see firsthand the power of culture in the context of diplomacy. And with all due respect to the State Department colleagues here, they are not implicated in this. I also could see that the State Department just didn't take culture seriously. It just puts it to one side. And so I have tried through my position at Georgetown and various other um, ways and initiatives to try to demonstrate the importance of culture in diplomacy. And the, the role, I think, is uh, captured by the great Nigerian uh, playwright novelist, Wole Sayinka, who said at the one uh, national conference on cultural diplomacy that was held in November 2000 at the White House, uh, Sayinka said, and I'm uh, condensing, culture humanizes politics demonizes. And I think you know we've never been more aware of the latter phrase than we are today. Uh, and this, this kind of separation of culture and politics was not always true in the United States. Interestingly, at times of conflict, and I would argue we are in a time of conflict now, uh, when in, in times of conflict, um, the US government and policymakers turned to culture and it played a very important ro role. I'll give you two examples. One in Latin America. In 1941, there was a symbiotic aligning of the stars when animators in Hollywood went on strike and the US government taking advantage of this asked and invited Walt Disney to create a couple of animated films for the Latin American audience with the goal of, of stemming the tide towards fascism in the lead up to World War II in South America. This was kind of an amazing idea when you think about it. And if you think that is amazing, what is even more incredible that is that the government, instead of just saying, okay, go, go make movies for Latin America, sent Walt Disney and his whole animating team to, on a nine week tour of Latin and South America to try to, incredible idea, understand the audience and see where they are coming from uh, and create films that will be you know, appropriate and understandable and meaningful in some way in that context. And there's a wonderful documentary about this made by, directed by the son of, uh, of one of the animators called Walt and Il Grupo, it's, that's what they were called. <laughs> uh, and it's based on the letters they wrote back, because of course that, that's, that was the means of communication then. And they produced a couple of films that really were quite successful. Did they, you know, they didn't say resist totalitarianism. I think they had a particularly independent minded speaking birds and, you know, things like that. <laughs> uh, um, but, I, but I've had students who said, oh, yes, I remember those films. My parents always talked about those films. They loved those films. Um, so there, there is one example. And the other is, I think, very well known to you um, the use of culture during World War II. Um, and what's best, I'm sorry, during the Cold War. And I think what's best known is, of course, the, um, the jazz musicians who traveled all over the world. And I think such an important point to make about that, particularly in today's climate, um, is that these were, of course, mostly African-American musicians traveling as ambassadors of a government that suppressed them horribly at home in the United States. This was during the era of extreme segregation and the Jim Crow laws. And what made an incredible impression on uh, 
audiences abroad, particularly behind the Iron Curtain, but in any country with a totalitarian government, which was most countries they visited, was that these artists, they were there to play music, and they did. But if anyone asked them about their life at home, they were very honest about it. And what I think is most commendable is that the State Department that sent them knew that. There's a famous story uh, in Dizzy Gillespie's autobiography where he says, they wanted me to go to some briefing before the trip, but I don't need any briefing. I know what this country is, and I have my own story to tell. Well, the people who sent him knew that and sent him. And nobody said, oh, you're just musicians. You, don't, you can't speak. You don't have anything to say. And it was this very freedom of expression that was not only tolerated by the US government, but actively supported and actually funded uh, that made such an extraordinary impression. But what we understood in the Cold War, and I think that's so important in today's context, was it wasn't just about sending Americans abroad. We also spent a phenomenal amount of money, some say up to a million dollars a year, publishing and distributing Rush literature from Eastern Europe and particularly from Russia. It was the United States that got Dr. Zhivago out of Russia and Solzhenitsyn's writings. And not only that, but also distributed them inside Russia. So there was a recognition of something so important that it's not just about sending Americans around and Americans' writings around, but it's about leveraging local voices, which was something that really just the United States had the capacity to do. Uh, and getting that word out, getting those creative voices out, and telling the world what was the story of the gulag, and disseminating them within the vast then Soviet Union was so important in seeding the idea of freedom and seeding the idea of a different system. And when you look at the situation we're in today, we are locked in a kind of ideological battle. And what's our answer? Drones, special forces, you know, that is, has a role, uh, but we're really talking about ideas here, and we have amongst our writers and every country that is problematic in this war against extremists also has their own writers. Very often they're suppressed by their own governments. Uh, and I wish that we would spend as much attention and learn from our own history uh, lifting up those writers and the ideas and the vision and the imagination uh, about individual freedoms, a different kind of life, a life that's appropriate in that place. And you know, we have the capacity to do that, and I think the State Department support for this wonderful program shows that you know, we know how to do this, at least in the United States. I just wish the people in the regional bureaus dealing with all these countries would take this seriously because it's a very serious thing, the incredible work you produce, and everyone should take it more seriously, even when it's funny. <laughs> and now from the State Department, <laughs> Amy Storow. Thank you. I'm looking forward to the Q&A. I think we might have some questions. <laughs> um, thank you, Rob. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, uh, Iowa. And thank you, ECA, for this invitation today. It's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to tell four short, tiny stories and then draw some conclusions from them. I'm kind of an odd bird in the State Department in that I myself have a Master of Fine Arts in Creative Writing. And I wanted to begin by telling the story of my taking the exam to get into the Foreign Service. There's a structured day where they run you through all sorts of tests, and at the end of the day, they say, is there anything you'd like to talk about? And I said, yes, I'd like to explain why a Master of Fine Arts and Creative Writing is excellent preparation for the Foreign Service. And this was my argument. 
Uh, first of all, it produces good writers, and you can't write well if you can't think well. Um, secondly, it produces people who have read deeply, and if you've read deeply, you have an understanding of human consciousness that cannot be gotten in any other way, and what could be more important for diplomacy. Um, it also um, means that you've spent extensive time in creative writing workshops, which means telling people things very gently that they don't want to hear. <laughs> and so that they absorb them and telling them, and telling them things that they do want to hear that they'll dismiss because they don't want to be embarrassed by them. Um, so that was the background that I came in with. I guess that speech was successful. Um, my second tour, I had the great privilege of serving in Skopje, Macedonia as a cultural affairs officer there. And when I arrived, um, within a day or so, I learned from the cultural affairs specialist there, Borka Taneska, that the famous writer Carolyn Forche was coming for the Skopje, for the Struga festival. And I had met her when I was 19, and I was dazzled, I thought, you know, this is like Mick Jagger coming to the States or something. So she came and she was spectacular. Uh, she loved the, the community there. She met, as did I, Vladimir um, Martinovsky. And the thing about it was that, you know, back in the States, if I told somebody, even if I told, to be honest, my fellow foreign service officers at the embassy, a famous poet is coming. They'd say, oh, ha, 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 Amy, that's an oxymoron. There's no such thing as a famous poet. But there she was, she was like the Dalai Lama, you know, she was on the front page of all the newspapers, she did major evening talk shows, um, and they loved her, and she came back more than once, I believe, since then. Um, what that taught me is that, although in America we have ideas about poetry as a kind of niche um, activity, sometimes for in a high culture context, the rest of the world, Poets and writers are public intellectuals, and they are here too, to a degree, but sometimes they've been usurped lately by comedians. Um, also there I met Nikola Majirov, who was an IWP graduate who went on to great success. Um, Carolyn and I kind of badgered poor Chris to make sure that he got into the program. And he went on to, his, his work is now available in more than 30 languages, and he's one of the, often called one of the most powerful voices in European poetry. Um, that resonated for me of what, what the hunger for poetry and so I drew from the work of a group that I used to work with called Writers in the Schools in Houston, Texas and decided that what we needed were um, the writers and residents of our American spaces which are like small branch libraries. So a woman named Marilee Cunningham agreed to come and she spent a week in residence at each of our three American spaces teaching creative writing to young people. Um, that program went so well, it spread to Serbia, where she worked in all of their American spaces there, and I also brought a different writer to Latvia. There, the thing, too, about that was there was Mary Lee Cunningham on the morning talk show, because in, in, in Macedonia at that time, the idea of formally teaching creative writing to young people, that is, teaching critical thinking skills, that is, teaching how to think clearly, was not something that was taken for granted as an activity. Um, my third little story is um, my previous job, I was head of the alumni office for, at the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. And there we launched a program called Washington Circle, which is an online talk show. So we had the privilege of having the poet Edward Hirsch as a guest to talk about civic engagement in the arts. And he was a spectacular guest, but I think the thing that really struck me was that the room that we did this in the Foreign Press Center in New York uh, was full of exchange students, current exchange students, and there were a bunch of people there from China. And one of them, and he was talking, you know, about all kinds of work, and he mentioned Chinese poets, and I think someone thought, haha, I'm gonna play gotcha with Ed Hirsch, and said, well, you know, could you talk about some Chinese poets that have really influenced you? He said, well, you know, for example, Li Po. And they just, they, they were staggered, you know. So I think it's really this, op, this idea, to go back to what Imagineer Schneider was saying, of mutuality, of uh, that Americans certainly don't know all the answers about everything, nobody does, but people-to-people -people exchanges are really, really integral uh, for building common shared language and, and shared values. So, um, and I wanted to also highlight for you that the next episode of the show will be on November 8th at 2 p.m. and it will feature Margot Lee Shetterly, who's the author of Hidden Figures, uh, which was then became a film. So if you can watch that, you can. Uh, please do. So 
what do we make of all of this? Why does it matter? I'm gonna argue two things. Uh, first, at the intellectual, their intellectual gains at the individual level, which all, everybody here already knows. Um, creative writing in particular, and is, it's the most complex and nuanced form of freedom of expression that we have as human beings that's verbal. Uh, with writers in the schools, that group that I worked for with way back when, and that group, the, the two poets who came to Eastern Europe, um, they've done a bunch of studies about the impact of their work. And what it shows is, and, and this was a third party evaluator from University of St. Thomas, the students who participated in the program showed measurable gains in writing skills and confidence in writing and creativity, as well as an overall increase in standardized test scores compared to a control group that did not participate in the program. And these are evaluations that have been going on since 1999. So at the societal level, what that program does and many others like it and the work that you do, you know, you who are participants, is you create the core of an educated citizenry. And there's nothing more important than that. Um, another thing at the society at level, societal level is that you are all, you know, a core of public intellectuals. And I wanted to highlight Vladimir Martinovsky's work for a second. I reached back to Post and asked them, what would they like me to say here at the Library of Congress? Um, and they wanted me to talk about Vladimir's walk with a, work with a professor's plenum. Uh, the main goal is to ensure independence of higher education institutions and the work on freedom of expression and spread from that, that goal to a wider range. So poets are civic activists. It's built into your DNA because you care about words and you care about thinking and you care about people. And we need you, so thank you. Um, we know there are many distinguished members of the IWP. For those who are current participants, I wanna highlight some opportunities that are available to you through the Office of Alumni Affairs. Uh, when you get back home, please do, you know, knock on your embassy's door or call them, you know, um, and ask to talk. If you can, say that you wanna get involved. If you have time, teach some workshops. Uh, do something, give back. I know that you want to. I know that's, that's built into who you are. Um, there are programs through the alumni office. You could, the address is alumni.state.gov. I particularly want to highlight for you the Alumni Engagement Innovation Fund, which offers grants of up to $25,000 for programs that you design yourselves. It's a competition that will launch again in February. Because um, I ask for you, what will you do with your success? What will you do with your mantle that you wear as a public intellectual? And I thank you for that and for your time today. Thank you, Amy. I do, I do want to say that um, you're welcome to visit us in Iowa City anytime you like, because that's the one place in America where if you tell someone you're a poet, they're excited about it, <laughs> which, is, which is why we are a UNESCO city of literature. Yes. Next, we're going to turn to uh, Santiago Giralt, our filmmaker, novelist, writer of screenplays from Argentina. Thank you very much. Um, well, I will mix a little bit of uh, biographical with, uh, with a little bit of some historical ideas. Um, I want to talk about international exchanges uh, and versus cultural isolation. Uh, when I was five years old, my sister, one year older, started studying English in an English academy. Back then, I wanted to do everything she did. I w she was like my twin sister. So, so she taught me how to read a year before I was supposed to learn it in school. I convinced my mother to go to the, to the same lessons that she went at the English Academy. And a few weeks later, after the classes started, my mother received a phone call from the Academy. At first she worried because like, a phone call was not like an ordinary thing. It was not about my sister, it was about me. Christina, the woman said on the phone calmly to my mother, you'll have to pay the tuition for your younger kid. Uh, he's participating in class, solving problems in the chalkboard, and honestly, seems more interested in the language than your daughter. <laughs> <laughs> so I started reading English and Spanish almost at the same time. Uh, year la years later, there was a famous French song called Joe Le Taxi by Vanessa Paradis. I love the sound of French. I asked my mom to send me to the Alliance Francaise. I've never forgotten the basics of the language I learned in those days. American, British, Irish writers made me love English. I consider myself an Anglophile. 
television sitcoms, subtitled movies and books, did the rest until I had some time to immerse in the language when I was 19 and I spent a year abroad. With my French, I used to, to go stronger with my knowledge after I discovered Marcel Proust and I wanted to enjoy the Francois Truffaut films without subtitles. And I hope to live to learn much more languages. I love languages. Um, I decided to be a writer in a country where we have already one sacred cow, Jorge Luis Borges. <laughs> <laughs> and at least other few international representatives, Julio Cortázar, Adolfo Villacasabre, Sabato, Manuel Puig. Many people ask me often, more often than I would expect it, how could you write under the influence of Borges? I just respond, he cited influence as much as Marcel Proust, Virginia Woolf, or John Irving. My nation is humankind, and my influences are not localized geographically. I would also ask that same person, how could you write after Cervantes? And there would be no Spanish literature to begin with. <laughs> so, <laughs> After the Latin American boom, a literary phenomenon that meant an expansion of Latin American literature in the world, and some of Argentina in particular. After that, in Argentina, we had a big dictatorship, then democracies, democracy, and after the crisis of 2001, a few years of populist governments. After the crisis of 2001, the politicians in Argentina had to rebuild the identity and the confidence of the nation by focusing only on internal affairs, on local culture. As a result, the politics became a way to reimagine Argentina within its own borders, and as a result of this, a new form of nationalism and cultural isolation emerged. It's like the country closed on itself, and uh, it, it, we, start, we started getting less news about international affairs. It was all about Argentina, as if it was the only thing, uh, thing that mattered. Um, so populism focused the, atten the attention on the myths of Argentina and recreated them to the fractured nature, nation. But the bridge ran deeper and deeper, and after 12 years of populism, the bridge became a crack. The crack, the crack became an abyss. Nowadays, society is divided in two, and the two fractions fight each other in a silent civil war. And, a cultu and cultural isolation became stronger and stronger. In Argentina, there's only one big airport, and less than 5% of the population travels beyond the bordering countries. It is a hard place for a free thinker and an artist who doesn't think the myths of Argentinian history are untouchable and who questions many of the central ideas that constitute the nation's identity. Actually, my first novel is about an affair that Perón had with a 14-year-old girl, so imagine how I I, 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 I embrace the Argentinian myths. Um, I am an Argentine. <laughs> I am an Argentine who doesn't eat meat. <laughs> I love traveling and I like to discuss all the time about the myths of Argentina. So where is my haven? Where did I find my haven? First, in the foreign languages that I've learned, in visiting other cultures, living inside a foreign language one that is not your mother tongue, is finding an adopted nation. To expand this concept, art has become my nation. For example, I started a year co-writing and directing a play in Madrid. I had to learn many words, as for example, every piece of clothing is called differently in Spain. A sweatshirt we call buzo uh, is called sudadera, and the name we use in Argentina means, for them, a diver. Uh, a, a women's sweater, or a pullover for us, would be a Rebecca, name, of that, name that came from the Hitchcock movie, and they use now for the piece of clothing. So I, was, I had to understand the nuances of the culture in order to understand basic things, and we are talking about like clothing. I spent the last 11 weeks in Iowa City sharing the international writing program with 34 other participants. Every time we had a discussion about gender, sexuality, politics, I felt like I was walking on broken glass. Understanding the boundaries of every culture was a fundamental aspect of this experience. Creating a common ground to share our experiences was another one. Artistic is exchanges are a way to break cultural isolation, or at least they are for me. It creates a land of exploration for many people beyond the boundaries of their own country, or region, and allow people to build a temporary society with temporary rules that apply to everyone involved. These rules allow the group to understand its own needs. I don't know what's going on with my, where is the rest? 
<laughs> it's just the ending. Um, <laughs> so these rules allow the group to understand its own needs and to explore dynamic forms of organization. Gender, race, religion, sexuality, systems of belief are obliged to coexist in a parallel society, a microcosmos that reflects all societies. In my own experience, it pushed me to go beyond my comfort zone and explore the beauty of human bonds. It's a way to remember how societies are built and how human forms of organization emerge. Thank you. Thank you, Santiago. And now, our last speaker, Enza Garcia Ariza from Venezuela, fiction writer and poet. And I've just learned the fellow lover of Joseph Brodsky, the former poet laureate here. Well, um, thank you so much for having me here. It's an honor to be in Washington as a resident in the International Writing Program. And I want to say this. It's an honor to be in front of you, my colleagues in the program, for the last time, at least for once. Uh, well, El Mundo es un pañuelo. Some years ago, a prominent writer from my country asked me why I plan to publish a book with the title of The Forest of Birches, if in Venezuela, Evidently, we don't have birches, or snow, or Russian literature. <laughs> he said, you should write about what you know, about real life, about your difficulties to finding a house in Caracas, about being sad and poor. So, one day you discover that you, that you must face and deal with the stupid people who use an abject nationalism to give you your place. Classists are as uncomfortable with themselves as with the rest of the world. For me, first as a reader and then as a writer, opening my arms and my mind was the most obvious approach. My national boundaries were blurred between foreign coordinates that sooner or later will become part of my most intimate landscape. Sometimes I get to like the person I am, and that's thanks to the poets of my country. Eugenio Montejo, Juan Sanchez Peláez was here in the residency in Iowa, Ida Gramco, Patricia Guzman, just to name a few. But I'm also Elliot, Blake, Milton, Pamuk, Akutagawa, Brodsky, especially Brodsky, and Akhmatova, Mandelstam, and also Iranian music, and the Irish fiddle, and colors and flavors that scare or confuse, but suddenly give you back to the kitchen of your own grandmother. We should go beyond the act of surviving. We should grasp the life, that life is an act of integral and integrating beauty in the ethical and aesthetic sense. Overcoming the always new barrier of cynicism and disappointment demands sharpening arise every moment to the prodigious diversity in front of us. And now I'm worried because I will hate to sound like a self-help and political correctness preacher, but I am not wrong, and I know that I am not wrong. <laughs> of course. The eternal question about identity also depends on the fact that we are many in search of the same answer and on the way it can be fun and stimulating to recognize that spark of similarity and difference. It is good to feel that you belong to a place, but it is much better if you can expand that, that landscape and add keys and mysteries from other universes. During my time at the International Writing Program, I saw how people love their own language and at the same time, develop new facets of themselves in a temporary language. Each contrast is a new perspective that allows the interlocutor to visit new regions of the spiritual framework. Writers, we are not easy people, but I think <laughs> that most of us start from a fundamental conviction. Nothing important can be accomplished without tolerance. 
without the divine curiosity that allow us to knock on a door and peek through. In Iowa, I had the opportunity to translate into the Spanish poems by author that I found in my way and to listen to my own work in other languages. A poem of mine in Japanese was one of the happiest revelations of my life so far. So, once again, it is clear to me that literature is a human act and therefore political, not because of its implication or ideological uses, but because it teaches us nothing more and nothing less than what we are made of, alone and together. Thank you. Thank you, Enza. And we can entertain questions from the audience, and I think we have a microphone that will be going around so that we can capture this for the recording. And while we're waiting for you to formulate some questions, I think I might just say, uh, it seemed to me that Santiago and Enza both gave us really wonderful definitions of writing, uh, maybe inadvertently, because Santiago described what happened in the IWP as a dynamic form of organization, which also struck me as being a, a good way to describe a novel, right? It's a dynamic <laughs> form of, of uh, organization. And Enza was talking about um, the essential of, and of integrating beauty, which is also what I think we try to do as writers. And uh, Amy, I, it occurred to me when you talked about Nicola Majira, I recalled that during his residency, we had a night we called Global Express of staged plays. And that year, we gave the writers a prompt and Nicola ended up writing a short play together with an Iranian poet. And they wrote it in English. And by the time the, the, the play was staged, neither one could remember who had written which lines. <laughs> so I think that's another kind of uh, dynamic form of organization. So I'm just treading water here looking for a question. And I have one here, from, first from Australia and then from Niger. Thanks for asking. that I know of, yes. Uh, and I would also invite uh, Ambassador Schneider to come visit the Educational and Cultural Affairs Bureau. Uh, <laughs> I have, actually, many times. I'm, I'm many sure times. Have. I'm sure and have. and I, yeah. I don't want you to misunderstand what I said. Mm -hmm. I think you all do wonderful work. Mm -hmm. I wish your colleagues in the other bureaus would pay more attention to the work you do. I think and it's always a work in progress. So th that, that's my point. Not that you shouldn't be yeah. doing what you do. No, I know. But that other, you shouldn't be isolated. So we talk a lot about isolation and integration. Uh, and, and I wish that you were not so isolated. I wish that you know people working on Pakistan and Afghanistan were coming to you and trying to understand through the writers. And you know, th that's all I need. For, for the record, I actually don't feel isolated, but well, thank good. you for concern. Good. Um, good. And, I don't, and this is, I don't want to get too inside baseball on this, but it's been really fascinating to me working in the Educational and Cultural Affairs Bureau to have the regionals come to us over and over and ask for more resources, more programs. And that's well, been really that wonderful is, to I'm see. I'm so glad to hear it. That is, that is really fantastic. I, just, I, I might just go a little bit to your question since I, was appointed ambassador having served, uh, having been an art historian my whole life, uh, having done 17th century Dutch art and traveled many times to Holland and know, knew the language and the history and the culture. And um, I found that actually that background um, as an academic, having taught in a university where you basically have to uh, you know, do a lot of research try to understand a new subject and then talk about it to people who may or may not agree with what you're saying, who are my students. Um, that was great background to be an ambassador because that's what you have to do all the time. Um, and and I, I do remember though the nervousness of my wonderful DCM and officers the first time I went to talk to the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Minister of Defense and it, there is, I experience this kind of macho thing with every, everybody else can have like notepads, but the ambassador is not supposed to. You're 
you're supposed to know it and talk and not look down to your little notebook. And I could see they were just terrified and just had no idea if I was going to know what to say or you know, start spouting off about Rembrandt or something. And, um, and you know, it, w it was hard, but, you know, I did I memorize a lot of my life, so I was able to talk about Joint Strike Fighters as much as, um, as much as about Rembrandt. And I did find that being able to make that, you know, connection as someone who had spent my career up until then trying to understand the culture of the country where I was serving, that meant so much to the Dutch. So that I was able to take, you know, the prime minister and the foreign minister around their own museums and and show them their exhibitions. I also did that um, with the, my own embassy staff. There were some great Rembrandt exhibition stuff, so I got them all in when the museums were closed, and you know, was able to introduce them to the to the local culture as well. And I I just would mention that um, I also had every ambassador has the wonderful privilege of being able to have a collection of art in the embassy. I, some go with their own personal collections. I did not have one and did not do that. But with the help of the fantastic bureau at the State Department that supports this program, I was able to identify just really fantastic works of art that in one way or another showed the connection between the Netherlands and the United States from a Calder Mobile in the uh, front hall to Klaus Oldenburg to Willem de Koning as well as the great Rembrandt Peel portrait of Thomas Jefferson. And you know that was a regular part of when people would come to the residence. I would give them the tour and you know they would walk in and they could see, they may not have known what the works of art were, but they could see right away that connection. And they loved seeing that connection, you know, and they'd say, wow, I never knew American artists thought that much about Holland. After, I'll just leave you with one story of the impact of, of culture, and this was on someone who worked at the embassy, because I love this. Um, after I left in June of 2001, so I wasn't there for the 4th of July party, and someone I encountered later in July said, oh my gosh, I was just at your residence. I was there for the 4th of July party, and a member of your staff gave me a tour of the collection that you'd had. And I said, but it was gone, all the paintings and sculptures had been sent back to their owners by then. And the person said, yes, that's right. But the person from your staff loved that collection so much that they took me through the house and said, this is what used to hang here. <laughs> and this is what it looked like, and this is why it was there. So that was one of my favorite cultural diplomacy actions. Antoinette. Yes, um, thank you all of you very much for the presentations, I, I found them really fascinating. I was listening um, with particular attention to some of them. I can't really um, engage with all of this, but I had a question for Amy Storrow. Um, you uh, referred to active um, cultural diplomacy on the ground with a lot of open-mindedness and you know a lot of understanding of the agency of people who are sent um, on American cultural missions. And I was wondering if this was like um, something that was restricted to a particular cultural context. Is this still going down, going on? Would this be something that would happen like today, for example? Um, I ask this question because as the director of a new arts program in my university, <coughs> I had a lot of relationships with our cultural diplomacy of various countries, including your own. And I have had I've heard the expression that cultural diplomacy is there to soften the ground, I'm quoting, there to soften the ground for political and ideological action. And I'm wondering that which of these um, perspectives correspond to um, US cultural diplomacy, let's say, over the past 20 years? That's a, a wonderful. Thank you, Cynthia, that's a wonderful question. Um, I think I'm gonna take first the part of it about when visitors come. I think I can give a really clear example. So my first visitor, as I mentioned, was Carolyn Forche. This was during the George W. Bush administration time and she had some differences with official policy. And so she gave a lot of interviews and in some of them she spoke against official US policy. 
And so I consulted my boss, you know, as a new officer, what is the guideline? And he said, well, oh, this is freedom of expression and action. This is why we have people of varying uh, perspectives give their views. Uh, and there was another sort of famous case of that of, of Juno Diaz going to Santo Domingo and speaking very strongly against official US policy. And it really surprised the people who lived there because they assumed that um, somebody who was being paid by the government on a program had to, had to speak that government line. And for them, that idea of freedom from expression was really eye-opening. Um, as far as softening the ground or not softening the ground, I think people view these things in different ways. Um, sometimes people view things as transactions. I think that's a very limited way to view the world, generally speaking, and that uh, ground comes in all different kinds of states, but that we are all people, and the more that we can learn from each other, the better we all are. create traditions, literary traditions, and so we have like American literature belonging to the English tradition, and of course Latin American tradition belonging to the Spanish tradition, but how important it is these days if we could have an American tradition that includes the whole continent, like we have the European tradition, or the uh, European literature. I think it's how important it is to build a tunnel from that wall there, that they're building right now that will open up an, an Ameri whole American literature of the Americas and we don't, we stop considering, oh, if it's written in English or it's written in Spanish, we say it's written in this continent and it's important and it matters to all of us. And what are the efforts that are being done to build that bridge, li literature bridge, and break this idea that if it's written in English or Spanish, it's that if America is one and the other America is. It's, so if there's any thoughts or ideas on how to build this, literature of the Americas, not America. Santiago or Enza, do you want to take that on? Mm -hmm. um, I think it uh, uh, sounds utop utopian, the idea that uh, we could bridge the language differences because also even in South America, the Portuguese uh, who have like the population almost of all the rest of the countries together becomes a barrier because um, translations are paid so little <laughs> that, uh, and and, the, and and I also feel like in my, in my country in particular um, literacy we have a big literacy like there's a lot of literacy in Argentina I mean, I mean kids could read but there's very little public libraries very little um, bookstores left in the like there's some small towns that don't even have a bookstore. So somehow I, I still feel like the fight has to be, again, first it needs to be stronger locally and it needs to be kind of like pushed from the local countries. Like I, in Argentina, in Buenos Aires, luckily even like it seems like a paradise because the bookstores stay open until midnight and there's beautiful cafes and some big theaters have been turned into beautiful book, bookstores, but if you go be, beyond the, the borders of Buenos Aires, the fights has to, it's, it's strong. Like I remember when I was a kid, there was this truck who would come to the town with books, and it was like an itinerary, like a, in an itinerary bookstore that I could go there and spend time, because my hometown had only one library that was like really, really, really old, and nobody wanted to have them. So I think before that, somehow, we have to, I feel like we have to create readers for the future because all the kids are with their cell phones and with their uh, pads and stuff like that. So in a way I feel that, that, that before I could think of uh, this broader idea, I think with lit stronger literacy and more, um, yeah, more, more access, better access to, to, to books. It's, I think it's a fight I would go for in my own country to begin with. Santiago, as you said that, I was remembering being in uh, Amman, Jordan last uh, December and we went to an event and when we came outside there was a car covered with books and it turned out it was this guy who would drive from village to village to sell books for, you know, like a dollar and uh, I bought a couple books from him. So <laughs> I think, uh, yeah. First of all, I'd like to say Teresa Bush and I am a retired museum professional in our 
art historian. And the number of years I worked at the Hirschman Museum and Sculpture Garden. And it was during that time that um, through the Department of State with a colleague of mine that we coordinated a program <coughs> Uh, with the international writers. And the Hirshhorn had in place a program called Using Art to Inspire Writing. And the writers would come, I guess you still remember that, Christopher. Oh, yeah. And they would I come. also remember you sent one of, one of your great protégés to the Des Moines Art Center. And yes. uh, she's still there, I think, right? Yes, I oh, yeah. so. <laughs> And um, the writers would come uh, one day and they would read uh, collectively from the works in one of the, the galleries. And the next day, Christopher would select a group of writers who conducted a workshop for the locals, who in turn produced writing that was read on Sunday afternoons. And all this was put in our bulletin, and it had quite a following. And the years were 2002 to 2005. So I'd like to thank you. And I happened to get the email and discovered that you were going to be here. That's why I came here and invited my colleague, Marjorie Vincent, who now lives in Pennsylvania, she was trying to get here to say hello to you as well. So I'm very happy to be a part of this program. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Mm. I think there's questions here and here. Yeah. And, uh, oh. Hi, Elaine Audrey. Um, I, I just wanted to add a little something to your comments about how an MFA is a great qualification for being a diplomat. <laughs> And um, because I've been in the business sector for a very long time, and uh, one of my exit interviews was about the glass ceiling for women directors on listed companies. And I said a certain qualification for all directors is they should read fiction. <laughs> um, but that is on the elitist side. I actually wanted to ask Enza, to what extent um, do you have your writing, and also Santiago, that your writing goes to masses, to the masses and the ordinary people. Because one of the best things I found in Iowa was not the readings to the people who loved literature, but the readings to the community. Because it, it was just amazing, you know, that their questions about our culture and things like that. So how did you do that in your own countries? And so, so. Um. I think I don't have that in mind when I'm writing because it's dangerous. Uh, I just want to write for the people who is there in that moment, for someone who needs to read that story that I brought to life. And I don't know, I mean, after my last book, someone told me, oh, I don't like anymore your writing because you are not sexy anymore. You write now a lot about Japanese reference. Now your characters talk about the books that they are reading in that moment. Your writing now is like too serious for, so, for, for a small group of people. And well, I don't know, it's sad, but I don't want to write for a specific audience. I just want to be who I am when I write. Uh, the other day, uh, with uh, Natasha in the class, I said something that really moved me now. I said, you know, I hate people. It's difficult for me to be among uh, a crowd. But when I write, I really love the things, the words, the characters, the humanity. So in the end, I really love that person that I am when I write. Um, and that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Audrey. All, all I could add only is, um, uh, as a filmmaker, uh, you have more pressure from a production start structure to think about your viewers because it's a more, in yeah, although the publishing industry could be tough, uh, the film industry, there, there's so much money you have to back that they really think about the audience. So you are in this conversation, sometimes you get these screen tests that are really weird. Uh, so that's why I do literature, to be free from that. <laughs> and uh, to expand the possibilities uh, of that. I also got, my first novel got published kind of by mistake, because it was finalist for this international prize, so I didn't even like think it would be published so quickly. 
Um, so yeah, I, I, I really what I, but I love what I really love from uh, from literature is that the the feedback that you get from your readers is so intimate. It feels uh, people are talking about themselves much more than when they're talking about movies because movie is more like a social thing, and uh, literature is so private. Like even my mother reads my novels like I'm like my diary, and she goes crazy every time. <laughs> <laughs> I also want I also wanted to say that. Uh, um, I would like to remember some other Argentinian writers that came to the International Writer Program. One of my them, one of them happens to be one of my greatest friends. He's uh, Leopoldo Brizuela, uh, and Martin Beckman, another writer director. Cristina Piña. Like I know many of them, and I really think that through the years, the people who had been lucky enough to be part of the program had become uh, lamplights for, like, uh, how to say? Um, Lanterns, yeah, for all the for all the ones who were coming behind. So even even I, I even wanted to come to the International Writers Program when I read it in the in the cover of one of Brizuela's books. He's my favorite writer. I said, oh, what is this? And I googled it. So um, it's it's also um, it becomes um, a utopian place to be part when you feel like your country is not uh, really getting getting your your inner poetry or your inner self, and so, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned Martine, uh, who's both a fiction writer and a filmmaker, and that year, uh, for a variety of reasons, the writers uh, had roommates, and his roommate was the playwright Mike Finn. And I said uh, to him one day, so how is it with Martine? And he said, uh, well, you know, I." I wasn't really planning to write. I was planning to enjoy myself here, but Martine writes every day, so <laughs> now I'm writing. <laughs> I think there was a question here. Thank you. So this is both from Mrs. Storo and Ambassador Schneider. I'm wondering, from being out in the field, do you see other countries doing cultural diplomacy? Do you see them doing it differently? Do you see it? Um, do you see this agenda being more important for either smaller countries or perhaps other larger countries? Well, I might um, tie an answer uh, to that into uh, coming back to uh, I might call it the other Cynthia's uh, <laughs> question um, when you were asking about culture kind of softening. Uh, softening the ground, and um, I think that there is also this entity called public diplomacy, which um, is different from cultural diplomacy, particularly as you're hearing about it practiced here, and the larger, in the United States State Department, the larger uh, bureau is public diplomacy with the mission really of promoting the understanding and acceptance of America's policies, which I think is a fabulous idea for the 1950s and not so appropriate now in this age of, of global communications. And fortunately, uh, and you can talk to this more, but it, I have the sense that the way cultural diplomacy operates is more in the way of cultural relations. And interestingly enough, the British have gotten rid of the word cultural diplomacy and just talk about cultural relations. I think to avoid the idea of what you said, that this is not a, a kind of backdoor way into getting you to accept what other, other nefarious policy we want you to accept. So while you're off watching this nice movie, we're doing this. And, um, you know, that, and even, and there, you know, cultural diplomacy a term, which I've used a lot, I'm, I'm increasingly um, troubled with because it has that kind of sense of, I have a goal and I'm going to use this to get to that goal. But I think what you've heard of today is, is much more in the nature of cultural relations and cultural exchange, what, whatever, you know, whatever it might be called. I've seen some examples I think that I really admire that are more in the way of this um, leveraging local voices idea, and, and it is often the smaller countries. Well, Great Britain's been doing this for a long time, and, 
and the you know the, the whole structure is different with other countries where they tend to be Great Britain, France, Italy, Spain, they all have, uh, even Scandinavian countries, they all have a slightly separate arm's length division that takes care of culture. And um, so they're a little bit less in my experience, I'm sure there's some exceptions to this, but there may be a little bit less about promoting their culture per se as um, leveraging local culture. So I saw, for example, a fantastic, no, you don't think so well. I'll just give you a couple examples that I have seen. They may not do it all the time, but <laughs> you have a fantastic whole hip hop event that the Scandinavians did in Alexandria in Egypt, um, bringing, you know, providing a stage and a platform and the opportunity to perform to local hip hop groups, which they don't have. And they, but that's what they want is to be able to reach their audiences. At the same time, the way, and this may have changed, this was about six or seven years ago, at the same time, the United States policy was to send American artists to places. So those are two different approaches. I'll give one other example that I think was really brilliant, which is what Great Britain did during the Olympics with Shakespeare. Um, and it was a fantastic way, I think, of showing how global Shakespeare is, and that is that they invited performances of different Shakespeare plays in local languages and in local idioms, and they were performed every night at the Globe. And I, you know, I don't know who assigned the plays. It was kind of weird, like China had Richard III, and of all things, Pakistan had the Taming of the Shrew, so there were some odd things, but, but the plays were, were really incredible, and what a way, you know, without saying, Shakespeare is global. It, it just came out through uh, all the performances. Uh, I would say I'd view it a tiny bit differently, but not, not hugely. Um, from my perspective, and I think from the perspective of the State Department, cultural diplomacy is part of public diplomacy. Um, and it's also a subset of exchange programs. So one interesting thing, you are all exchange program participants who came here on J visas, which are for exchange programs, uh, is how many of them are bilateral agreements. So for example, the Fulbright program um, I believe that funding from Germany is three times the amount of American funding that goes into a Fulbright program. So many of these programs are, in fact, they go both ways. So the more that we can collaborate with each other and not view it as a competition, um, I think is, is great. There are models out there that I, I admire. I think that what the Brits do or what the British do with ed English in particular is very impressive. Um, but I think we've all got a lot to learn from each other. And, I so wanted to go back to the softening the ground uh, comment for a second. Um, it's an interesting idea, but I don't think that life works that way of ha ha ha, we're gonna send Cynthia on a program and then our nefarious plan next to go back to Ambassador Schneider's remarks is then this will happen. You know, life is far too complicated and complex for, for that kind of thinking, I think, to really work. Um, I am a kind of true believer and a purist in a lot of ways. Uh, and I really, really believe that exchange programs and cultural programs, but all kinds of exchange programs are what make the world a stronger, safer, better place. Right now, around the world, one third of all current heads of state or current heads of government are exchange, are exchange alumni of US government funded programs like this one. That's a tremendous legacy um, that, that you share now, you as alumni, as almost alumni. You know, I, I would just recall a former poet laureate, uh, Robert Pinsky here, who had a wonderful project called the Favorite Poem Project that he did around the year 2000. And just to say, I think it is absolutely true that we don't have the same, I think we do have the same kind of public intellectuals, but again, for whatever reason, we don't take them as seriously. 
as they are in other countries, which you're you know, absolutely right. And in Palestine, it's Mahmoud Darwish, who's really the founder of the country, or Iqbal in Pakistan. Uh, and, and yet, you know, why don't we automatically say Walt Whitman here? I don't, I don't know, but Robert kind of punctured that idea with his wonderful uh, favorite poem project where he, in, and this is before the internet really, he was interviewing people all over the country, all different walks of life, asking them, what was their favorite poem? And the book puts it all together with you know, the construction worker loves Walt Whitman and the uh, Cambodian refugee loves Langston Hughes. There's just two examples I remember, but these are very much people from all walks of life for whom poetry is really important. So I think it's out there, but somehow we just don't see it as much. And I'd add that there, you know Chile also has a model of Neruda to, to draw from. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yes, exactly. yes, as as the diplomat <coughs> poet. And I read once that um, more Neruda has published more books than any other work of, liter of literature except for the Bible. So that is a global legacy right there. So. I, I, we were getting the, the hook, but my hands keep going up, so I will. <laughs> Yeah, I think we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to end things. Uh, you do have the opportunity, though, if you want to talk to all of our um, panelists afterwards, please do so. Uh, Georgette Dorn pointed herself out. Uh, Mary Jane Deeb, the chief of the African and Middle Eastern Division, is here. Uh, our area studies divisions have amazing reading rooms, and if you're not scheduled to go see them, uh, African and Middle Eastern, Hispanic, European, and Asian, you should check them out today while you're here and maybe meet uh, the curators that are responsible for your countries. Uh, but for now, let's thank our panelists. Thanks so much for being here. <laughs>